Hello and welcome back to PC Retro Programmer. In this video I'm going to take you through the process of setting up a development environment uh, so that you can do assembly language programming for the 8086 and 8088 CPUs. Uh, so you'll need a suitable machine of course and I've just chosen to use an IBM AT equivalent, a 286 machine and 8 megahertz here. Uh, you could use something later, it just has to run MS-DOS. Uh, if you're doing VGA programming you might use a 386 or a 486. And uh, if you wanted to you could also use an emulator, for example DOSBox. Uh, or if you wanted something earlier, uh, maybe a PCEM or 86 box. Now I've just installed DOS 6.22 on this machine uh, because it's very easy to install. You just put the first disk in and boot from it and it will take you through a setup procedure which is very straightforward. It will wipe your drive for you uh, and install DOS in a DOS directory and even create an autoexec.bat and a config.sys for you. So by default it puts uh, all its executables in a DOS directory on the machine and in particular there's going to be an edit.com and a debug exe in there. So the debug is for debugging programs and of course edit is just a text editor. Uh, I think I have uh, DOS 6.22 with the plus development pack or something here which is what all these additional DLLs and uh, you know other Windows stuff is. Now you don't actually need to be in the uh, DOS directory to run these executables. Uh, by default it sets up a path command so you can run them from anywhere on the drive. And we can actually see that by running the editor uh, on autoexec.bat and uh, you'll see in that file uh, where it sets up a path command. You can see here path c colon backslash dos. Now uh, this editor is reasonable for assembly language programming, at least for small programs. Um, it has some useful features for programming. For example, if I hold down the control key and press the cursors, it'll jump one word at a time instead of one character. And that's very useful. On older machines especially, it can be very time consuming to move about one character at a time. Now, of course, you can also set up a mouse on your machine and then it all becomes much easier. You could just run mouse.com and you could even put that in, in here. Uh, so that the mouse drivers run automatically when the machine boots. Uh, the other thing you, you can do here, uh, you can actually select text by holding down shift and pressing uh, the keys. And uh, I can also select whole lines at a time by just moving the down key. And if I want to cut and paste, I just do Alt E C and move to where I want to paste the line and Alt E P for paste and I can cut and paste. Uh, so this is obviously essential for a uh, programming editor. Uh, if I hold down shift and press the down key I can select the line but unfortunately this particular editor won't delete the line uh, after I selected it. Uh, so that's a little bit of a downside to this editor in my experience. Uh, I can hold down shift and control at the same time and select entire words at a time but then unfortunately when it gets to the end of the line it just starts selecting whole lines uh, which might not be what you want. Uh, so another feature that's very useful uh, and absolutely essential in a programming editor is a search function. So if I do Alt S F uh, then I type in a text string that I want to search for, K-E-Y-B for example, it'll find the first occurrence of that. If I do Alt-S-R, it'll repeat that same search and then it'll find the next occurrence and so on. Uh, so this is uh, the basics of what you'll need for a programming editor. Um, now if you have an older version of DOS, uh, don't worry, there are other editors that will work. Uh, there is one that I like to use, Cedar Island Editor, ciedit.exe, and I typically set that up in the path here. I put uh, c colon backslash ciedit, if that's where I've installed it, and a semicolon to separate the paths of course. And then uh, I usually rename the ciedit.exe to edit.exe and then I can uh, use it as a replacement for a DOS editor, especially if I'm using an older version of DOS that doesn't have an editor installed. 
Uh, now that editor is actually very similar to this one, but it's a little bit more reliable in general. I think the only bug that I found is the search function doesn't work from the first line. You have to be at least on the second line. Uh, but this is not a huge downside, I think. Now the other thing you're going to need, of course, is uh, a, an assembler. And for this series of videos, I've chosen to use the Borland Turbo Assembler, TASM, uh, which was used back in the day. And I'm going to take you through how to install that now uh, on your machine. Now to install Turbo Assembler is pretty straightforward. Uh, you basically just put the first of the two disks in the floppy drive and you go to uh, A drive of course. And if you take a look, uh, you'll see that there's install.exe and it's just a matter of running that. Uh, so it'll take you through an install process which is pretty straightforward. So first it just asks you to press enter to continue and uh, then it'll ask you for the source drive which is the A drive in my case and then it's going to ask you where to install it. Now that doesn't really matter too much uh, because I'm going to put c colon backslash tasm in the path command in autoexec.bat and so I'll be able to run the assembler from anywhere on the machine anyway. Uh, so I'll just go straight down to start installation here and let it do its thing. Now I'm using Turbo Assembler 2.0 here, which is the one I re would recommend. I haven't found any bugs in it so far. That doesn't mean that there aren't any, of course. Uh, but it seems to be generally pretty reliable. Uh, now there are various other assemblers you could use. You could use A86 or Massim, uh, the Microsoft assembler. Uh, but the Ball and Turbo Assembler uh, is the one that I'm familiar with and the one that I'm going to use for this series of videos. Uh, so it'll just go through and do its thing and install all the files. Eventually it'll ask you for the second disk, uh, which you can put in the drive. And it'll go through and install the remaining files. Uh, the second disk uh, includes a lot of examples and we'll take a look at one of those examples uh, in these videos here just to get us started. Uh, but there are a lot of other examples there that you can look at. Uh, documentation is available online. Uh, Archive.org has the official uh, original documentation for Turbo Assembler 2.0 um, and uh, there are a couple of different documents there. I think there's a user guide and uh, something else. Uh, so there is a link in the description to where you can download TASM. Uh, it's WinWorld. I'm not sure if that link will continue to work. I don't know whether they actually uh, like uh, deep linking or not. Uh, but at least you can find it very easily with a Google search. Uh, so it's now recommending that we go into autoexec.bat and add TASM to the path, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, so. Uh, we'll go back to the C drive and we'll edit autoexec.bat and then it's just a matter of adding TASM to the uh, path command here. So semicolon to separate and then C colon backslash TASM. And now I can run the assembler which is just TASM uh, from anywhere on my machine. And that's really uh, all that's required uh, to set up your basic development environment. Uh, as I said, uh, you might want to use Cedar Island Editor if you're going to be doing a lot of programming or writing very large programs, but uh, this is all that's necessary to get you started. Now let's just take a quick look at what it's installed for us. If I go into the TASM directory here, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a whole load of different files. Uh, that includes a lot of example programs. Those are all the ones with .asm uh, extensions. So when you write an assembly language program, you typically give it the extension .asm. And uh, if I look at just the exe files here, the executables, uh, you can see there's TASM, which is the assembler, and there's TLink, uh, which is the linker. Uh, so there's a two-stage process in creating an executable. The first is to run the assembler, which takes your assembly language source file, the one with the .asm extension, and converts it to an object file. And then you run the linker. You might have one or more object files, which then get 
combined together to make an executable a .exe file or uh, you know I'll also show you uh, that you can make a .com file which is a, a small kind of executable. Uh, so uh, those are the main things there. The other thing that's quite useful to us is make.exe and I'll show you how to write a make file uh, in a later video but that just allows you to automate a little bit uh, building an executable from an assembly file. Uh, so that's basically what's there. Um, the simplest example in here is hello.asm and in a later video we'll go through this and uh, describe exactly what's going on in this file and then we'll write a, a slightly simpler version of this uh, and we'll make a .com file instead of a .exe file out of this uh, just to get our bearings and uh, give a first example of writing assembly language.